Revelation chapter 5. Ooh. Ooh. Spicy. Come on, uh, welcome. <laughs> I know this is kind of like the first ever West Region house sector service. Uh, if you're a bit crammed up and you're annoyed that the other person is you know, constantly budging you with that elbow, please forgive us. We will do better next time, right? Um, uh, the boys will get better heat, uh, heaters. <laughs> And uh, I do want to thank the brothers for the hospitality and the round of applause. Thank you, Aldino. This is not always the case. Uh, we normally meet in town hall, but uh, this uh, Sunday we decided to uh, split up into sections, so because our church is all over Sydney and whatnot. Uh, but uh, I do want to thank the brothers for allowing us to use their house. Um, I also do want to. There's a special seat here if you guys want to see, uh, sit down and stuff. But. Um, I do also want to thank Kevin and just uh, helping out with uh, providing breakfast. Yeah. Come on, Kevin. Yeah. So if you have a little something to uh, eat beforehand, that is all uh, just Kevin and the brothers just uh, with their lovely kindness and hospitality and allowing us to use this very space that we're using for church. Uh, but anyway, tell you about the Revelation chapter 5. So the uh, notes for the lesson has already been emailed out, I believe. Uh, Joe emailed it out, I think, either Friday or on Saturday. So if you're new or visiting here, just nudge the person next to you and tell them to send you um, the notes. If not, you can just use your Bible because we're not going to cover many scriptures today. Mm. Especially now that I only have about, what, 20 minutes. Let's go, bro. The title of our lesson is The Cost of Being a Disciple. Mm. On, the Cost of Being a Disciple. Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. Before we get into it, uh, if you're visiting with us today, we are going through as a church a parable series. Now if you don't know what a parable is, a parable is a physical or kind of like a real life story that has a spiritual meaning behind it. Mm. And if you know anything about the Bible, it's got a lot of very powerful and useful parables, yeah. which Jesus tells indicating certain spiritual lessons that we are to take out of it. Um, in Luke chapter 14, that's the parable we're going to be covering today, and it's uh, parable 28. But before we do go there, we're just going to quickly look at Revelation chapter 5 and kind of lay out a, a platform for our um, title. So if you guys uh, look to... Revelation chapter 5, we'll start from verse 6. Now, like I said, the cost of being a disciple, that is our title for today. You know, there are two types of people in this room. People that go, man, is there really a cost for being a Christian? Because when I go to a denominational church, or I go to any other church that's outside of this room, they tell me that it's all about loving and giving your heart to Jesus. That it's okay to show up on a Sunday and just go, I love Jesus, and go back home. Whereas, there's other types of people as well. Other people that are sitting here going, man, really, what's so special about Christianity that there's got to be a cost, you know what I mean? Right. We're like, man, I don't think I can handle the cost anymore. Amen. You know, what you guys got to understand is whatever decision that you make in life has a cost. Right. It has a cost. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know, but human beings are incredibly generous and sacrificial when it comes to things like costs. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, some of us, I mean, coming back here, so like Genesis said, we came from Samoa, right? And one of the things I've been very shocked with with, uh, with people here is like almost everyone has an iPhone 13. Right, and I think that's the latest iPhone there is. And I'm just like, holy moly, there's like, back in Samoa, the only iPhone I knew was iPhone 6. I come here and it's even more than double that that people have. And they don't just have one camera, they have three different, like, of those lenses. And I'm like, let's go, bro. I don't know. You know, it's kind of creepy. Next thing you know, you'll have iPhones covered with all sorts of lenses, you know. Uh, maybe filled with, I don't know, just, it's just kind of scary. It's like, oh, it looks like a three-eyed little... <laughs> gadget that you have. But anyways, but people are so sacrificial in what means to them. Mm -hmm. And I think for us to understand the cost, you've got to ask yourself, how much is Jesus worth to you? Mm -hmm. How much is Jesus 
Worth to you. Come on, bro. You know, I don't know if you know much about Revelation, but uh, Revelation was written by a man or a brother to us by the name of John. Now, history tells us that John was supposed to die in an auditorium where they brought him because he was preaching in the name of Jesus, and they brought him to boil him in a pot of oil. And even going into that pot of oil, John was like, Jesus means everything to me. And they're like, no, you got to stop preaching about Jesus' name. He goes, no, Jesus means everything to me. And so they took him into this pot of oil, boiling oil, and they just throw him in there and he just starts boiling. The craziest, probably creepiest thing happened where he did not even die, neither a scratch as well. He just got out of that boiling oil and it says every single person in that auditorium believed in Jesus from that day on. The Romans at that time felt so creeped out by John that they decided, okay, let's send him to the island of Patmos because this guy is nuts. <laughs> but that was only John's message was, Jesus means everything to me. Mm. And so he writes this in chapter 5. We'll start from verse 6. And here, he's now in a conversation in some ways. He's receiving a vision from Jesus. And now he's in heaven and it says in verse 6, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and twenty-four elves fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding gold, golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. Now, there's a lot going on right there. And you may read that and go, what on earth is going on? All we know is that there is a bunch of creatures here. But the thing I want to highlight out the most is it talks about... The golden bowls full of incense. And what is the incense? It is the prayers of God's people. You know, they say the greatest tragedy in Christianity is not unanswered prayers. It's unoffered prayers. Mm -hmm. Disciples who just refuse to pray. Mm -hmm. When we decide to go to Google more than to God. Mm. When we go, okay, I need to go study this out at uni because maybe the more smarter I am, the more smarter I am to deal with my problems. Mm. Let me guarantee you something. This city, Sydney, has advanced so much in knowledge but has gone even more stupid uh, more than ever. Every single year, people get stupid and stupid and stupid and more stupid. Come on, bro. Seriously. We are so educated that we are so dumb in dealing with relationships. Mm. We are so educated that we don't even know how to educate our own men and women and even children. Yeah. You know, on Friday night we did a topic for our Bible talk, talking about educating the heart. Why? Because when you look at people here, they educate the mind and never the heart. Mm. And no wonder why divorce is just rising. Yeah. You know, even in churches today, it's so sad that people have to go and educate themselves with ideologies because the churches have failed. Because religion has failed. And so people then go, you know, you know, I was even talking to someone on Friday and he goes, I believe my worldview is that we are in a simulation. Now I don't know if you've ever done any coding, right? But a simulation is, there's a bunch of code you, you, know, you punch in and that's how basically your life is lived throughout. He goes, we live in a world that is simulated by someone. We don't know who that someone is, but that's our life. And I go, well, what about people that grow up and just want to kill themselves? And he goes, well, I don't know. Well, that's, I don't know about that. And I'm like, you can't just claim to have a worldview that doesn't accommodate for everyone. Because right. truth is truth, no matter how poor, how smart, how stupid, how broke you are. Mm -hmm. Amen, disciples? Let's go. <laughs> or how rich you are, the truth is for everyone. Right. And I go, that's the most selfish thing you can ever say to someone. 
I mean, you can say that to me because we live in a safe country. But imagine saying that to someone who's trying to pick up scraps from the rubbish to survive. Right. Going, that's the simulation you, you were simulated with. Mm. Right? That's the most hopeless, unloving thing that you can ever do. Amen. But why have people gone to ideologies? Because the churches have failed. Amen. Come on. Pentecostal churches, Catholic churches, the list goes on. Yeah. They have failed to tell people about the truth. And so people then run to educating of the mind because their hearts have been broken by those who were supposed to educate. Mm -hmm. You know, Aristotle once said, educating the mind without educating the heart is no real education at all. You can be so smart, get a degree, but I promise you, three decades from now, your life will come crashing down if you don't know how to educate your heart. Yeah. So why am I talking about the cost of being a disciple? Because it's the only cost that will matter. Yeah. Not taxes. <laughs> I mean, we all hate taxes, right? Not uh, government tax or federal tax or whatsoever. I mean, it's nice that, you know, in one month time, we're going to get our tax refund. Amen, church? <laughs> and we're going to use that for special. Amen? Yeah? Hey, hey. But um, no one really likes the cost of anything. I mean, why don't we all go to the gym? Because it's painful. The cost is painful, <laughs> That's right? It. That's it. But let's continue on in verse 9. It says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased video games. Hey. Oh, sorry. You purchased an iPhone. No. Oh. You purchased... A flat screen TV. You purchased new shoes. No, it doesn't, right? It says, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. You know, right there we see what you're worth in Jesus' eyes. He uses blood. You are worth His blood. Not His time, not His sayings, not His book or teachings, His blood. But you've got to ask yourself today, what is Jesus worth to you? Because when something is that worth to you, it does not matter the cost. Now people go, oh, well, what about people who just love to sit on TV? And I mean, they want to become great, but they just love to sit in front of TV and enjoy themselves. They have sacrificed every single dream that they have so they can sit on a couch and watch TV. Everyone can sacrifice. Why? Why have they been able to sacrifice that way? It's because their comfort is worth more to them than achieving what they want. Mm -hmm. Anyone has anything that is worth to them. I mean, some of us go to lengths in not sleeping at all by just so that we can get degrees, right? Mm -hmm. But how many more sleepless nights can we do for God? Mm. Right? For things that matter. I mean, when you look at the world today, it's so crazy that we live in a world where everything we decide to want to have is we want it cheap or we want it small. I mean, even in working out, five years ago, I saw an app or I saw an advertisement on fitness that said, how to get six pack abs in 40 minutes. Two years ago, how to get six-pack abs in 30 minutes. Yesterday, how to get six-pack abs in 10 minutes. <laughs> we want what we want with a less cost. But that's not the reality of the life that we live in. You know, uh, a guy named Dietrich uh, Bonifer, who lived in a time when uh, Germany was basically the most powerful kingdom or nation there was, on the earth at that time. And in that time, there was a church that was in uh, Germany. And in that time, the church had started to be re very plagued and affected by uh, Nazism. People were following their culture while also claiming to be a Christian. At the same time, the church was plagued by cowardice. People were so afraid to tell people that they were Christians for fear <coughs> of Hitler killing them. And this guy, Dietrich Bonifer, got up and he preached against it. He was like, man, we need to not be a church that is full of cowards. 
He got up one time and he openly um, condemned atheism and Nazism. The price he paid was he got killed um, by the army himself. You see, people get killed for what worth uh, is worth to them. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. We're going to look at a parable. And we're going to look at what Jesus says is the cost of being a disciple. That's what's going Luke chapter 14, verse 25 to 35. It says in Luke 14, verse 25 to 35, Jesus says, this is a parable. He goes, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. The word disciple basically means a student, a follower, right? A learner of Jesus Christ. And he goes, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation, while the other is still a long way off, and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is neither fit for the soil, nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know... I have four simple points, and I'm going to try and keep it short. Point number one, the cost will af affect your relationships. You know, when we look at Luke chapter 14, verse 25, we see here that Jesus goes on to say, look, if you want to follow me, you've got to hate your parents, wife, children, siblings, and even your own life. People go, oh, well, that's harsh. That's the price of you trying to do something great. I mean, when you look at every single successful person there is, very rarely will you find them with good relationships with their family. Yeah. The Lord say they're rarely home. They're rarely here. Seriously. The only issue, the difference with being a Christian is you get to live that way with such a greater and more meaningful purpose. Yeah. You know, we have uh, brothers uh, in our church in Pia Samo. So Jen and I used to lead the church in Samo. And uh, we have two brothers that we call the brothers of thunder. Again, you know, there's a scripture that talks about James and John being the sons of thunder. And uh, their names are Frank and Metu. And, uh, you know, getting baptized, I remember when uh, Metu, so Metu first got baptized, and he's the younger one. On the day of his baptism, his brother Frank showed up, and he goes, Hey, is, I, I know this is church, and I know you're the one that sets all the rules. I'm like, firstly, I don't set all the rules, right? Jesus sets the rules. He says, oh, okay, okay, okay. But I know that my brother's getting baptized. Is it possible for me to get baptized with him? <laughs> and I was like, why do you want to get baptized with him? And he goes, I feel like my brother needs me to baptize him. I was like, okay, oh firstly, uh, calm down a bit. Uh, this was Frank. I was like, calm down a bit. We'll do some Bible studies and we'll show you what baptism is all about. And so anyways, Matthew goes on to get baptized. Two weeks later, Frank gets baptized. And he goes, the reason why I got baptized, man, like I've never seen my brother change so much. Like, he's done things that has just shaken the life out of me, going, that is not him. Mm. It's either he's possessed, or he's really a real man that has changed. <laughs> and so he gets baptized. And one of the challenges that they faced when they were in Samoa, is they, their family wanted them to travel over to New Zealand. Now, if you, if you ever know anything about the islands, everyone on the islands wants to get out of the islands to come to Australia or New Zealand, right? It's that concept where everyone is in wants to get out and everyone who's out wants to get in, you know what I mean? Um, but everyone in the islands, they look at you guys and they go, man, I really want to be like that. Man, I wish I could wear a jacket and a hoodie, you know? I feel like I'd be the coolest person ever. 
right? And I remember, I remember when I uh, FaceTimed them like a couple of weeks ago, and they were like, "Bro, oh, you're wearing a jacket." You know? I was like, "Hi." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm doing good. They're like, I'm wearing a jacket. Whoa. And they're looking at me and goes, oh, you've gone so white. <laughs> people, there just, people there just adore the life here. And so his family, um, sadly, you know, they grew up, the, um, the parents have separated. And as a result, uh, her, you know, their mom has gotten to know the, her own partner in uh, Melbourne. Uh, and the dad moved over to New Zealand to be with his partner. And so the dad um, decided, hey, we're going to bring over Frank and Metu from Samoa to New Zealand uh, because we want them to have a better future so they can have better opportunities, make better money, and, you know, for the future. But also at the same time, Frank and Metu had four younger siblings, sorry, three younger siblings, who Frank and Metu had to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, mom wasn't really doing a thing, dad was going on by himself, and so it was up to Frank and Metu to provide for them. And so they were telling them, hey, you guys have got to move over, not only for you guys, but for the future of the younger three that are there. And they really struggled and wrestled with it, and I had to really you know, show them some scriptures. And in the end, they made a decision to stay. They told their dad, look, we would come, but where you live is too far from the church. We don't want to lose our relationship with God. I know if I go to any other church, I don't think I'm going to stay faithful. I know what it's like. I've been to other churches. And that's what he said to us that. And the second thing is, I'm not really worried about my younger brothers. I know they're only like six, seven, eight years old and so forth. But I'd rather them grow up and be poor and find Jesus than grow up with a healthy future and be arrogant and not find Jesus wow. at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because that's what Jesus is worth to us. Mm -hmm. And so as a decision, they decided, you know what, we're not moving to New Zealand. Two weeks later... Uh, their cousin, who's now a baptized disciple in the oh, church, hey, in the hey, Henry, moves over to their home. And they were, he was so confused. He's like, why are these guys even doing this thing? They're like disobeying their mom. I mean, they were good. They were, don't get me wrong. They were good like uh, sons and that. They were always doing what their mom wanted them to do. But when it came against the church, they were like, no, mom, sorry. We have to go to church. God is first. Mm -hmm. And he was so surprised, like, why are you guys even doing this? Then he started studying the Bible, he found the truth, and is now a sold out brother of yours in Samoa. Oh. You see, the cost of living as a disciple, it will affect your relationships. <coughs> it could be for the better or for the worse. But the great thing about God is, it goes worse, but it will get better. Mm -hmm. It will get better. You know, uh, Jenna's also seen with my own mom, when I became a disciple, man, it, it really, she just spun out of control. Now, I don't know if you know much about the Samoan culture. Maybe for some of us it's very different because I find that Sydney kids are quite arrogant with their parents. And I think, you know, <laughs> I think the parents haven't done a good job. And also the kids, sometimes we can be so independent because we have an iPhone and we have Google and, you know, we have jobs everywhere that we can find. Anyways, um, growing up as a Samoan, you do not, you know, disobey your parents at all. It's like one of the biggest sins you can ever commit <laughs> yeah. is disobeying your, parents, disobeying your parents. I don't know what it is in Sydney. Maybe the biggest sin you can have is not having an iPhone or maybe not going for New South Wales and Queensland, you know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe whatever the biggest sin is that you commit here. But in Samoa, that's the one thing. And on one day, my mom got spun out of control and got so mad at the fact that, man, I'm, a, I'm living as a disciple and I'm putting God first. She spun out of control so badly, she cried, and she just walked on the road in the heat of the sun. Now, Samuel is hot. Even helping out of the shower, you'll start sweating. That's how hot it is. She walks out midday while the sun is beaming down, and she just cried with her head down, walked out to the middle of nowhere. I don't even know where she was going. And in Samoa, there's this rule where you're like, you just never, you're just not allowed to make your parents cry. And those were one of the things that it really shook me, and it went on for about a good six months, and I was like, man, my mom's probably gonna have a heart attack and die soon if I don't change. But I was like, no, Jesus comes first. And uh, a few years later, three years later, she, we left uh, Samoa, and she was like, oh, I miss you guys so much. You guys were the greatest thing ever. You know, I, maybe I wanna become a disciple, right? Ooh. But it had to get off bad. Mm. But see, you're, um, your decision to follow Jesus will cost your relationships. You know, you may be wondering, why did Jesus say to hate your family? Well, if you go to Matthew 10, 
Maybe let's consider and see what he actually meant by it. He goes, anyone who loves his father or mother, verse 37, it's in the notes as well. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You know, what is Jesus worth to you? How much are you willing to give? How much are you willing to invest? How much are you willing to sacrifice? And like I said, human beings are incredible at sacrificing. You know, I think one of the things that we really got to ask ourselves is as well is, you know, when it comes to uh, marriage, I know, you know, I was hoping there would be more married couples here, but it's only uh, Eric and Christine and us. But you've got to ask yourself, even as married or even as singles, man, what relationships have you allowed to hinder your zeal for God? You know, your zeal to be all out, your zeal to give your special contribution. You know, point number two, the cost will affect you every day. Go to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. You know, in Luke chapter 14, verse 27 that we read, Jesus says you've got to carry a cross. But in Luke chapter 9, 23, it says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. He doesn't say take up your cross every Sunday. He goes every single day. Day. Yeah. Now you may be wondering, what does it mean to carry your cross? Well, in those days, if you were to carry your cross on the road, everyone would look at you and go, man, that person's life is over. Because you can't just throw it down and then run away. And then, uh, you know, because what happens is the soldiers will come and catch you, beat you even worse, and then go and crucify you. And so whenever anyone carries their cross, they go, man, their life is over. And Jesus goes, man, if you want to follow me, you've got to hand over every single key that there is in your life. The key to your heart. The key to your computer. The key to your phone. The key to your life, really. The key to your bank accounts. I know that uh, Paul talked about businesses and money. Everything. Jesus says, you've got to give up everything and live for me. You know, how much... Are you willing to follow Jesus? You know, point number three, the cost will affect your plans for your future. I mean, if you guys go back to Luke chapter 14, if you guys look at the passage, specifically in verse 28 to 29, he goes, look, if you're going to follow me like a builder, you're going to sit down and go, can I finish this building or this tower or not? Because if you don't follow, if you don't follow through and finish it well, it's no point at all. He goes, you've got to seriously sit down and be serious about what you want to do. You know, I remember. So I uh, graduated this year from uh, a bachelor of degrees in uh, civil engineering. Really? And uh, I remember the first time uh, the professor came for one of my courses came, and it was the first lecture ever in my four-year degree. Firstly, he rocked up and he stood there and he goes. You know what you're going to learn here uh, in civil engineering? It's all going to be rubbish, right? Don't worry about it. It's all rubbish. Uh, but still do learn the terminology because you're going to learn it in the working field. And then uh, in my fall field, you know, everyone was like, oh, it's still rubbish, right? <laughs> and uh, there was one time he was doing a presentation and whatnot, and people were just talking. And he just stopped the presentation, looked at the kid that was talking, and he just swore at him. <laughs> like, just swore at him. It's like, why are you, da -da 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 -da, you know, I'm not, not going to swear. But, um, you know, he just laid him out. He goes, why are you laughing? And everyone was just like, this dead silence, and it was awkward. And you know that moment where you're just like, should we say sorry, or should we, I don't know, go to sleep, or close our eyes, or pray to God for something, you know? And he just stood there, and he stared this kid down. And then he got up, he looked at the class, and he said, look, you guys have got to stop playing around. Engineering will cost you your life. Because if you do it wrong, people will die. If you do it right, uh, you may not get applause for it. But even with doing it right, if you still get it wrong in about five years time, you'll still be sent to jail. And he goes, I'm in a court case right now, and I may be sent to jail for life. You wanna mess around with that? You wanna play around with that? 
you've got to make sure when you build something, you are serious about it. And then you swore, you swore some more. <laughs> you just don't Okay. And I think about that, and it's like, man, how about even our lives, right? Yeah. Such as building a building, it's the same thing with building our lives. Everything that matters when we build will cost us everything. And I think very often we play around with it, you know, especially here in Sydney, like, we just play around with it, we go off. Like, I've got my friends, I've got life, and I can drink a bit of alcohol and live my life, do whatever I want to do, and, you know, it becomes this game. And then we later on find out that it costs us even the things that we want to build, whether it's our families, mm -hmm. friendships, relationships, these things that matter the most. But it's going to take you your life and even your future. You know, uh, we have one uh, sister in Samoa as well. Uh, actually, the first person that got converted in Samoa in about three years ago, her name is Faye, uh, one of uh, Eric's favorites. But uh, last year, we were, you know, raising special contribution. And she got to a point where, like, man, I, I don't know how to get the funds for it. Because in Samoa, it's actually very difficult to get money when you're a student. You'd be very, very lucky to get a part-time job in Samoa. Because in Samoa, people don't have money um, to pay you for part-time. Like, there's loads of money in Sydney. You can have a part-time for three, four hours, and you'll be good to go, <laughs> you know? But over there, they go, you've got to be full-time, or you've got to go study. And so sadly, a lot of the disciples that come into the church, it's hard for them to raise special because they can't study and at the same time, they can't work. And so for Faye, she was like, okay, I need to raise about 800 tala, which is about maybe, what, 600 Sydney dollars, which is, to be honest, like, I don't know, one week's pay, would you'd already get it, right? Um, and so she was like, how do I do this? And she just prayed, she just prayed, and then suddenly... She thought of uh, the fact that that very year, so Faye always wanted to be a photographer. She loves nature, she loves taking photos and whatnot. Much like uh, Sybil and even George right here. And it, it's such a passion for her. And the cost for a, for a camera there, it's about like more than a grand, like a proper camera that she could take photos with. She found out that her auntie was gonna give her money to buy that, because her auntie knew that, man, this is what she wants to do in the future. Instead of using the money to buy the camera, she uses the money and gives it to special. She goes, I'm going to give all of it. It's like, oh, yeah, you can give it like 800. She's like, no, I'm going to give all of it. And she did. You know, some of us, we already have the money, but we're busy buying video games, buying this, buying that, buying new shoes and so forth, and we haven't even given to special contribution. How are we going to help people see that this is the greatest thing that they could ever have if we don't believe without giving? that this is the greatest thing that we have. Yeah. We've got to lead by example in that. Yeah. And we've got to have a uh, highlight for you. Point number four, last and final point. Don't worry, I'm coming in front of me. The cost will affect who you follow. You know, who you follow will be determined by the cost. You know, in Luke chapter 5, you may be wondering, man, why is Jesus is so hard on this? Well, number one, there can be only one king. But if you look at Luke chapter 5, and um, you'll see certain passages, Jesus kind of talks about the same idea in different angles. He goes in verse 8, 11, When Simon Peter saw this, he fell on his knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. So they were, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So they pulled up their boats on the shore, left everything, and followed it. In verse 27 and 28 it says, After this Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his, at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything he had, and followed him. In Mark chapter 10, verse 21 and 22 it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack. A lot of us think, God, oh, Jesus loves me, therefore he won't call me to give up anything. He goes, no. Go sell everything you have. And give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad, because he had great wealth. You know, Jesus goes, man, it's got to be everything, and everything alone. Maybe for some of us in the room, um, we've been disciples for maybe one, two, three years. And we're even thinking about quitting. If there's one thing in your life that you should not do, it's quitting. It's quit studying the Bible. It's quit doing your quiet times. It's quit being a disciple. You know, quitting will destroy your character. It will. Yeah. 1 
Firstly, it destroys you mentally. You start thinking about quitting. And then it destroys you emotionally. When you start feeling like quitting. Because that's how it happens. Firstly, you think of quitting. And then when you actually quit, then you start feeling. And what happens is the more you quit, it gets to a point where it becomes a default and it gets inherited into your subconscious. Now, I don't know if you know, if you study that much uh, psychologists, they say that the brain is, or how people function is on two states. The subconscious state and the conscious state. And it says the conscious decisions that you keep on making will eventually enter into the subconscious state and you will become that very person. Mm. You've got to not live a life of quitting. If it gets hard, you keep going. You keep sacrificing. You keep investing. You know, in 1978, I don't know if you guys heard of a woman named Diana Niad. She set in her heart to um, swim all the way from Cuba to, I believe, uh, to the United States. I think it was Florida. Yes, it was Florida. Now I remember. And this journey was probably over 300 kilometers in open water. Now that was hard. And it was in 1978 she decided that. And as she was making the attempt, she got to a point where she swam and she swam, and sadly, the weather was really terrible. There was lots of storms going on in that open water, and the, the tide started really getting rough. And it blew her off course, and it eventually blew her off the water. And so she stopped, she failed. And she never tried again. She sat there, did not do anything because she was like, it's done, I, I give up. Until about three years later, three decades later actually, three decades later, she makes a second attempt and she fails again. This time, she got stung by poisonous jellyfish. Right? Maybe uh, when you're studying the Bible, you kind of feel stung a bit, right? Like someone like looks at you and goes, this is what you, where you're at. Right? You need to study the Bible, you're lost. Or maybe you're a disciple and you feel like that way, you know, you got jellyfish all around you. Whether it's bitterness, you know, it's just, oh wow, I feel it, you know. Or whether it's, you know, an interest saying no to you, or I say, oh, 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 oh. Or maybe uh, your evangelist comes up and goes, you need a chest. It's like, oh, 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 oh. It's like, oh you, you need to build some character. You don't have enough muscle on you, you know? And that's what we're trying to work out with the boys, you know, build character, amen. amen, amen, amen. amen. But anyways, um, Life gives you all sorts of poisonous jellyfish, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. Until, <coughs> in about August 2011, her fourth attempt. You see, three decades later, her quitting sat with her in her heart. It broke her down emotionally. It broke her down mentally. She kept thinking about it, thinking about it. I did something and I quit. You know, some of us, we may think, oh, maybe I'll quit being a disciple, and then maybe, I don't know, 10 years later, I'll come back and be sold out, right? Don't you ever get tempted with that? I've been tempted with that. But see, when you quit, it does more damage than you think. Mm. Yeah. And so she sits there in August 2011, at 64 years old. Wow. 48 hours turn into 63 hours. And for the first time in August 2011, she completed the swim all the way in open water from Cuba to Florida, United States. She completed the very task she set out to do. You see, it's even harder when you quit. But the one thing that you should do is never ever quit. Now, I don't know if you guys know about Winston Churchill, one of the famous prime ministers in uh, England, right? <laughs> He's known for his very long, boring speeches sometimes. Not boring, but sometimes very long, often very long. Yeah. He was invited to speak at his uh, um, former high school that he went to. And everyone, as he got up to speak, everyone was like, oh, this is going to be another hour-long speech. He got up and he says, never, ever, ever give up. And he sits down. The greatest speech he's ever done. <laughs> you can probably, you know, do four points from a sermon from that, you know what I mean? The greatest speech he's ever done. You see, I've thought of giving up. I've felt like giving up. Right? I don't know if you felt that way too. But one thing you'll never find from me is that I give up. Mm -hmm. I never will. I may be weak, 
I may be in sin, in trouble, but I will never, ever give up. And that is the cost of being a disciple.